The book of Jonah records the greatest foreign missionary enterprise in all of history. Never before or since has such a monumental work been done on foreign soil within the compass of a single day. The repentance of Nineveh under the preaching of Jonah is an event unprecedented in the annals of both Israel and the church. The story divides into four simple parts. First of all, we have the word from God. Then we have the word with God. And then we have the word for God. And finally, we have the word about God. So Jonah was summoned from a little village called gath Hefer, a small town just three miles northeast of Nazareth on the boundary line between Zebulun and Gad to go to Nineveh, that great city at its zenith, about 60 miles around, a vast city for that day and age. The inescapable missionary challenge of the multitude. And the inescapable missionary challenge of the man I don't suppose anywhere in the Bible you have a greater example of God demonstrating that he is God doing his perfect work with an imperfect instrument. Jonah was the unmerciful servant of the Old Testament. God could have said to him what Jesus said of the man in the parable. O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me, shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee. He was the elder brother, the Old Testament elder brother of our Lord's other parable. For he drew near to the house and heard music and dancing, and he was angry and would not go in, Therefore his father came out and entreated him. Such a man was Jonah. God picked him out of all the people available on this planet. Picked him out to deliver the word of God to the wickedest city of his day. He was an interesting fellow, this man Jonah. He was fierce. He was bold, he was self-willed, he, he got angry very easily. He was a man of red-hot passions, all set on fire of hell, all needing to be quenched and rekindled and set on fire from above. His name means the dove. Wasn't much of the dove about Jonah, more of a hawk than a dove. But God knows what we are like when he calls us. If he wants a Samson, he doesn't call a Samuel. If he wants an Elijah, he doesn't call an Elisha. If he wants a Paul, he doesn't call a Peter. He needed a certain kind of a man for this job. He had to be as bold as a lion and hard as steel. He wanted a man to burst into that great city to thunder at its conscience and to bring it to its knees. Hard to find men like that. It's worth noting, by the way, that when it was all over and many centuries had come and gone, that Jonah was the only prophet to whom the Lord Jesus directly likened himself. He didn't liken himself to Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Daniel, to Amos, Hosea, Joel, Micah, any. He didn't, didn't liken himself to any of those fellows. Likened himself to Jonah. When you think of Jonah, you think of Jesus. You think of Jonah in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. Did Jesus just like me? He was just like me. I think he liked Jonah. Jonah was just like him. He is a man who went through death, burial, and resurrection. And so you have the word of God. The challenge of the multitude, the man, and the message.
go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. It's a message of doom. But that's where God always begins. He begins with the work of conviction. If a person doesn't come under the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, he's not likely to be saved. That's where God begins. Jonah wasn't sent to Nineveh to preach a social gospel, to build a crystal cathedral, or to make friends and influence people. He was sent to Nineveh with one word and one word only, wrath. The cauldrons of God's wrath are bubbling and boiling on high and are about ready to be poured out on this wicked city. He took that city by storm. So we have the word from God. Then we have the word with God. Jonah's response was immediate. God said, Arise, Jonah, go to Nineveh, that great city, cry against it, for their wickedness has come up for me. And Jonah said, Blessed be God. That's the best news I have ever heard. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. In 40 days, Nineveh, a smoking ruin. Hallelujah. Bless God. That's the best news I've heard for centuries. The armies of Nineveh had desolated every country in the Middle East. And Israel's doom was written just as clearly in the book of God as Nineveh's. Jonah was prophet enough to know that his own land was ripe and overripe for judgment. He, he was a prophet enough to know that Assyria with its great city Nineveh was God's instrument to thrash his apostate countrymen not long hence. Well, he said to himself, thank God, it'll take God more than 40 days to catch up to me. If it cost him his life, he would arise and flee, and then the judgment would have to fall on Nineveh, and his people would be spared and saved. Off he went to Joppa, the seaport on the coastline of Palestine, down along the waterfront. Here and there, tied to the, uh, the, the bank, was, uh, was a ship with a captain and a crew, loading or unloading merchandise. I can see Jonah as he goes up to the first ship, he says to the captain, I say, captain, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to Tarshish. Well, Tarshish, you know, was the uttermost parts of the west. As Gog and Magog were the uttermost parts of the north. Jonah thought to himself, Tarshish, that's the end of the world, going westwards with the setting of the sun, that's the way... Uh, uh, captain, would you take a passenger? Yes, I'll take a pass. You hurry up, mister. He said, if you want to get on this boat, you better watch the time, because I'm watching the tide, and as soon as the tide turns, this boat's going. If you're back here in 25 minutes with your ticket, I'll take you. But I'll tell you this, there wasn't a shipping clerk in Joppa who could tell Jonah what it was really going to cost him to get on board that boat. I see him running down the, the, the dockside, he's, he's got his ticket in his hand, he says, A berth, mister, I've got a, I got, you got a ticket, mister, mister sailor. Give me a berth down, down the bottom of the boat, would you mind? Put him down there in the bottom of the boat in an old bunk in a corner. And he... I don't know if he was curious enough to come up and watch them weighing anchor and setting sail. He, he was a Jew. Jews didn't like sailing, sailing business very much. Stayed away from it. Left it to the Phoenicians. I had been curious enough to watch them set sail. Maybe did. And as soon as the, the ship got past the headland, it began to re run into the great breakers coming in from the far west of the great sea and the boat began to rock and, and it began to heave and toss and the wind began to blow and Jonah didn't feel so good. Down he went back down to the bunk lay back on his, on his back and pulled the blanket up over his head and tried to forget where he was. And then it says he went to sleep. They woke him up, you know, when the storm came and uh, they were desperate, they, they, they did everything they, were, they could. He, they, they, they went down and dragged him from his bed and they asked one of the most pregnant questions in the entire Bible. They said, what meanest thou, O sleeper? 
What do you mean by going to sleep when the whole world is being torn apart? He listened to the howling wind. He looked at the heaving sea. And he knew perfectly well that all that bad weather was the di direct result of his own bad behavior. They asked him some questions. Who are you? I'm a Jew. I'm a believer in a God called Jehovah. What's your name? My name's Jennifer Jonah, if you want to know. It means dove. Where are you from? I'm a Hebrew. I'm a man sent by God. What's your occupation? I'm a prophet. I'm a preacher. What are you doing on board this boat? I'm running away from God. Why aren't you praying to your God? I can't pray to God, you fellas. He, he won't listen to me, because I'm not listening to him. Well, they said, do you have some kind of a word for us, Mr. Preacher? <laughs> yes, I do. Throw me overboard. There's no doubt about it that a backslidden preacher, a runaway prophet, is a danger to everybody he meets. He's a peril to himself and everybody else. So at last, they did as he said, and they threw him overboard. When they threw him overboard, a big fish or a whale, one gulp and down he went, swallowed alive. You imagine. It says something for his stubbornness that uh, although he was now in what he himself described as the belly of hell, it says something for his stubbornness that he waited three days and three nights in the very belly of hell, his going through torments we cannot imagine, the gastric juices of that, that great fish working away on his flesh. Three days and three nights before he started to pray. And then we get our first glimpse of the real Jonah. He prayed. Oh my, how he prayed. And when he prayed, his soul, was, his soul was soaked and saturated in Scripture. You go up there and analyze that little prayer of Jonah. He quotes from Psalm 42, verse 7, Psalm 31, verse 22, Psalm 60, verse 1, Psalm 77, verse 3, and Psalm 3, verse 8. And then just before he died, he called out and he said, Salvation is of the Lord. The fish couldn't stamp stomach that. <laughs> Got rid of him. The word from God. The word with God. Now becomes the word for God. I see Jonah now cast up on shore. He just watched the whale depart back out into the great deep and one big flap of its tail fin and down it goes and John Jonah he, he the sigh of relief get rid of that M means of transportation I see him he looks north and south east and west and it says the word of the Lord came unto Jonah a second time a second time saying arise go to Nineveh that great city Jonah made the belated discovery that the sand glass of 40 days was not going to begin running when he received the message, but when they received the message. So it had all been for nothing. But he must have been a hideous sight. Livid from the action of the acids in the whale's belly, his face must have been a nightmare, something to frighten people with. I can see him as he's heading north towards Nineveh. And it's getting dark, he wants an inn for the night. I don't think he'd venture, venture into the inn without muffling up his features as much as he could. I see him, he sits down, he gets himself a corner, gets himself some supper and finds the darkest corner in the inn. He's eating his meal. and. Place is rather full. A fellow comes in and looks around, sees empty space by Jonah. He says, uh, Mind if I sit with you, mister? I'm a fellow traveler. Jonah pulls back into the shadows. The stranger tried some conversation. Didn't work very good. 
It must have gone something like this. Where are you heading, sir, if I may be so bold as to ask? Nineveh. Oh, Nineveh, you got business there? You might say so. Uh, what's your particular line, my friend? I'm a preacher. Oh. Huh. Wouldn't have thought there'd be much of a market for preachers in Nineveh. I don't suppose there is. Well, let me give you some advice, Mr. Preacher. You be careful. You listen to what I say, because if I were you, Mr. What? Let me ask you a question. What are you going to preach? Me? I'm going to Nineveh to call down the wrath of the living God upon that place, if you want to know. That's what I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach hell, fire, and immediate judgment. Oh, uh, none of my business, of course, Mr. Preacher, but uh, I know Nineveh pretty well. You know, I have customers there. I've got a business there. I'll tell you something, Mr. Preacher, you'll be in deep trouble. <clears throat> if you start preaching like that, you'll get yourself flayed alive. I've already got myself flayed alive for not preaching like that. <laughs> I'm not afraid of Nineveh's big battalions. I've got the armies of heaven with me. I sometimes picture to myself, you know, I learned, learned long time ago, it's great help to preaching if you use your imagination a bit. <laughs> I see that he finally arrives at that great city. He looks up at the massive walls of Nineveh and its great towers. And I see him as he marches boldly up to the gate and he demands an entrance into the city. And the sentry says, who do you think you are? He says, take a look at me. Oh, okay, come on in if you want to come in. <laughs> Almost fainted away at what he saw. Brushes past the guard and his voice raises the echoes of the streets and lanes of the great city and the crowds come running. Men blanch white beneath their swarthy skins and women fainted at the sight of him. See him, he's in the marketplace, now he's in the sports arena, now he's marching through the barracks. The message was brief, only eight words. It was blunt, yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It was blessed. From the king on his throne to the cattle in the shed. The whole of that city instead of coming under the uh, outpoured wrath of God, came under the power of the blessing of God. Brief, blunt, blessed. You see, the real message was the man. Yet, 40 days, stood there at the, at the intersection of two great highways, lazed his voice, five weeks plus five days. Nineveh shall be overthrown. Do you know why he was so successful? He was a man who had been through death, burial, and resurrection. He had become a living epistle, known and read of all men. It was written all over him. They said one to another, God, his God, punishes sin. Look at him. It's written all over him. But there he is, he's alive and well and walking through our city and making us shake in our shoes. A man back from the dead, God not only punishes sin, but his God pardons sinners. Is written all over him. The dove of God spread its wings in the streets of Nineveh that day and a million people were saved.
one day's journey. And that great city from the king to the cattle shed repented at the preaching of Nineveh, of Jonah. Million souls saved, you say? Oh, yes. They were saved, all right. You mean, you mean they, they were just spared from uh, the judgment? Well, of course, it means that too, but it means they were saved. You say, well, how do you know it says that they, they were saved? Because it says so. What did the men of Nineveh do? It simply says this, that the men of Nineveh believed God. What did Abraham do? What made Abraham a pilgrim and a stranger on the earth, heading for home? To that celestial city, that city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker was... What turned Abraham's thoughts and feet homewards and heavenwards? What was it? Abraham believed God. That's all. What did the men of Nineveh do? What Abraham did, they believed God. If God saved Abraham because he believed God, that'd be something extraordinary if he didn't save Nineveh on the same terms. Men of Nineveh believed God. They, they did, may not have had a Bible full of theology, but they, uh, they had the convicting work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. And they believed God. And it says, they've counted unto them for righteousness. If you go back in your Bible sometime to Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 10, you read this, A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast. What did the men of Nineveh do? When they repented, they went out to the cattle shed and put sackcloth and ashes on their animals. They regarded the life of their beast. Almost inconceivable, these bloodthirsty men who had marched into every capital in the Middle East and left havoc and ruin and terror behind them everywhere they went. They went out to the barns and, and put a sackcloth of ashes over little lambs and calves and cows and cattle and things. That's how greatly they believed God and it changed the way they behaved. What more could you want? A righteous man regarded the life of his beast. Oh, that's revival. That's what happened in Nineveh. It happened about, and, and then you have this, finally, this word uh, about God. Could you believe it? Jonah was mad. He was absolutely enraged. He settled down to wait the end. He, he, he said, I'm going to count off these days. Forty days. He said, yet yeah, forty days. There's day number one. He hasn't done anything. There's day number two. He hasn't done anything. I, the doom seems to me has been cancelled. Heat sounds of revival overtook him. Jonah was mad. I knew it, he said. He said to God, I knew it all the time. I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness. I tell you, that must be the greatest statement about God in the Bible. Thou art a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness and all it did was make Jonah mad there's a little side story in, in, in the unfolding of the drama of a little ramshackle shanty and a shrub a ramshackle shanty and a shrub yeah a little shrub that grew up and cast its leaves over a little shelter that Jonah had made for himself and the, the, the little plant cast a shade upon his shack, and Jonah was very thankful for that. He was glad for the gourd, it says. And then, would you believe it, a worm got into the ground and, and, and singled out his little, little gourd for supper. And that little worm ate that little gourd. And Jonah was mad about that. He reminds me of those people who can contemplate with complete indifference the wrath of God being poured out upon a pagan world and at the same time get all worked up about a shrub in the backyard of their house which gets blight and dies. Last you see of Jonah, that's the last you see him, sitting sulking on the top of the hill, God remonstrating with him. 
But there was another chapter. Jonah didn't write that one. There came a time when he ceased being the elder brother and just became the old-fashioned prodigal son. And he said, I'll arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. Make me as one of thy hired servants. He got up and he turned his back on Nineveh and headed for home. And somewhere along the way he came to himself and then he came home. Realized what a fool he'd been. I've often wondered what would have happened if Jonah had stayed the full 40 days. If on that first day when the revival broke out, he didn't fall down on, on his knees and give glory to God. Wonder what would have happened if he'd done that. I wonder what would have happened if he'd stayed for the whole period of time, the entire 40 days and 40 nights. Why, instead of just Nineveh being saved, perhaps every major city in Assyria would have been saved. The revival might have spread far and wide. People from Nineveh might have marched down south to Israel uh, to preach the gospel to them. And uh, it might never have been necessary for God to have introduced the times of the Gentiles if Jonah had stayed for the full term of his mandate from God. But he didn't do that. He went on home. And the shock and the terror of that ghastly countenance worked upon his fellow countrymen as it had worked upon the people of Nineveh. They said, they said to him, where have you been, Jonah? Where have you been? What happened? What's happened to you? What happened, Jonah? And he said, you listen to me. I'm going to tell you the story of a wind, the story of a whale, and the story of a worm. It goes something like this. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah and said unto him, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And he wrote the book, you see. He preached it to his hometown folk, and then he wrote it down. And now it's part of the living word of the living God. I wonder how many millions upon millions of people have been saved from that day to this who got saved reading something in the book of Jonah. I wonder how many people who not only were saved from something they read in the book of Jonah, but who were sent as a result of what they read in the book of Jonah. I have this strong feeling that at the judgment bar of God when traveling days are done, and Jonah's name comes to be called and he steps forward. God will say to him, Jonah, my dear friend, well done, well done. Lord, there remains the inescapable missionary challenge of the multitude, the man and the message. We ask thy blessing upon the preaching of your word and pray that thy Holy Spirit might bring fruit for God out of contemplating the story of this man of whom Jesus said, in this he is just like me. May we covet that for ourselves. In Jesus' name.